thank you all for, for joining me today. Um, and thank you to our, our assistant. Um, I appreciate you being here and, and getting questions and admitting everyone. Um, I, I tend to be a little bit informal in my presentation. So please just, if you have questions, if you have um, comments, please jump in. And um, this, sorry, I'm Laura Light Greenleaf, hello. <laughs> from Atlantia in the Sacred Stone area. And um, I've been a gardener, grower all my life, professionally and mostly as a hobby, um, professionally earlier on in my career. And um, just a hobby now. Uh, I am a, a North Carolina master gardener and I've taught in, in master gardeners, I've taught in schools and in the SCA, and it's really a passion of mine. As you can probably tell as we go through the presentation. Uh, I have done some classes in the, in the past at Penn State and universities on growing medieval vegetables, uh, medieval kitchen gardens, and, and um, um, growing a feast, which, which grew out of, um, well, we'll get into that. But what I wanted to talk about this time was something that my friend Geese there um, got me very interested in is doing a group project for growing a feast. And later on in the presentation, I'll share some of my experiences with that. And hopefully that will help you if you're interested in this. And I would absolutely love for this to be a group project. We have a chef who is willing to work with all our gardeners and present something perhaps at War of the Wings. It seems like the most, most logical event that many of us will be, be at War of the Wings. And by then our crops will all be in. Um, and it's still in the development phase and we would love you all to participate in this. And if you're interested, um, my email is right there and um, or, or put a yay me in, in the uh, comments or however you want to reach out. And you'll be hearing more about it. I'll, I'll send you all, I have your emails through the, the um, Atlantia University and, and I can email you all and I can uh, give you more information about it. And a lot of this grew from the, the um, agricultural guild that we just started, agricultural and animal husbandry. All right, enough blah, blah, let me get into this here. All right, this is my, I've been posting this lately because this is so me, you know, one minute you're young and hip and carefree and the next thing you know, you're photographing vegetables in your garden. And some of you out there, I know it's absolutely true for you too. So the first thing I, I wanna look at is how do we know what was grown back in the medieval times? Well, we have lots of documentation for what was grown and a, a lot of it comes from recipes. And, um, you know, they're not just leaving blanks. They're telling you exactly what you want to put in. We have pictures from illuminated manuscripts, manuscripts, documents, some of which I mentioned there. And, you know, going way back to Roman times with Pliny and listing all the wonderful, um, his natural <laughs> history, listing just about everything. And uh, Charlemagne as well. We have... Um, medical documents and we have trade records and garden monastic garden plans showing what you what you should plant where and how it should be raised and how it should be used and a lot of this is how do we know what we have today is um, similar to what was grown back in medieval days and there's a few different ways that that um, I've researched that will help us to determine the closest variety you can get to medieval uh, vegetables, med medieval plants. And, and one of the things is um, types of plants that have a lot of genetic drift uh, typically are going to be different than the ones grown in medieval times. Uh, and of course, if you think of things like carrots, carrots will seed with all the other carrots around and, and other, other things in the carrot family like, like skirret, which is a medieval vegetable, did not have, 
been bred true, so you didn't have to worry about it changing very much, but we'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, okay, and the next thing is, where the heck do you get all this stuff? Uh, there are heirloom seed catalogs, and one, one way to find if um, you've got a good old variety is when it says, when you look through all your seed catalogs, you said this was grown in Holland for the last 500 years, which happens to be true for a perennial kale that, that I have in my garden. And, you know, I think it was in Holland. And if it's grown in the same place, same thing, and they love it for the past 500 years, you know, you probably figure, okay, let's, let's try that one. And uh, colonial varieties, if you can get things that are colonial, um, you know, true, back to colonial days, it's pretty much grown in, in Middle Ages too. It wasn't really until colonial period when we started to see a, a lot more of the um, hybridization of vegetables and other plants. And there are plant societies too that you can uh, get information from. These sites uh, that I have listed here, I clicked on all of them earlier to make sure they all worked. There was one of them that may have been Bountiful Gardens that isn't around anymore, but their website still has some great, they have just a page with other resources listed, other historic plants and heirloom and, and open source varieties. Anybody have a question so far? Okay, just pipe in if you do. And, I'm you know, curious about the perennial kale variety, like where you got that or what. Uh... It, it was, I think it was from Mid Gardener, Michigan Gardener. And it is a variety that came from Holland. And it, it's one of those varieties that grow up and, you know, you pick off the bottom, the bottom pieces. Um, it, it grows better in and I don't know how well it would do if, like it's, if you're in zone five or six, it probably wouldn't survive very well. Here it survives through the winter. It, the top part tends to die back and I get a lot of side shoots, but Ooh. that's okay too. Um, yeah, I'm in seven, so it should probably, yeah, I it, think it would be yeah, okay. And, and I'll make sure when I send out an email to everybody after class, I'll make sure I put the variety, the specific variety name in there. And there are a couple different, there's, um, perennial vegetables. And I was kind of looking into that. I have what, you know, what they call an edible landscape or what you plant on your property is, is a lot of perennial stuff that you can eat instead of ornamentals. But so here are some things that I've grown in the past that are pretty good, would be pretty good for a feast if we're going to do a feast. And the, um, the varieties, the different varieties, like on the left of the screen, the carrots and the beets, the one I'm holding in my hand there, that was more of a period style beet that you have. And the cabbage and a lot of these heirloom varieties are starting to come back now, which is kind of exciting. And that funky looking um, cauliflower all in the right, in the bottom and the broccoli um, rubini there, which is grown for the leaves as well as it's the little flower heads, and that is very good. Never grown that; it's fantastic. And of course, the um, what do I have there? They're not beets. Oh, they're the Spanish black radish, which are really good, and they're super, super hot. So, so anybody, if, you, if you've got a little land, if you've got a bucket, you can grow most of this stuff. And and um, some of the other ones that are not as common, uh, like the the cardoon or artichoke. Again, I have trouble growing that here. It needs um, a little bit more porous soil than, than I have. It might do good in a, in a um, container, I don't know. And then the uh, red kohlrabi, which if you like kohlrabi, if you're a kohlrabi fan, it's not as good as the white kohlrabi, like the Vienna kohlrabi, but it was considered more, it's more period. It's an older variety. It's a little woody, but it's all right. And the next one is skirret. And I would love if we could get people to grow enough skirret to, to um, make it a, a little demo feast. It was around forever. Um, I, think it's, it's, I think it's mentioned in Pliny back in, you know, like the first century in, in the Roman Empire. 
and it's a starchy vegetable, root vegetable, similar to parsnips, but it doesn't grow a single taproot. It grows all those hairy things there. And um, salsify, which is the next two pictures, the, the top right one, I think that shows some of the purple flowers. It's kind of blocked right now on my screen. So um, also um, the um, salsify root is on the left there. And it's supposed to taste like oyster. I didn't think it tasted much like oyster, but it wasn't really, I didn't really like it. So I haven't grown it since, but okay. And oh, they seed like mad, self-seed like mad. So if you want something that's easy to grow and self-seeds, so the salsify. And then the Romanesco broccoli that actually looks like a cauliflower, but it was, um, but it's a broccoli. And that, that is making a comeback too. A lot of these heirloom vegetables. And that is so cool looking. It is very cool looking. And they come in a variety of colors too. My, my um, sister works for um, um, Brain Fog. Uh, she works for, <laughs> anyway, my sister works for this place up in New York on Long Island where they, they do vegetable trials. And she, they grew some of this. And, and we had one around Christmas time when I went up there and it was huge and it was really delicious. But anyway. The broccoli? Um, yeah, it's a broccoli. This one right oh, here. That's beautiful. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I Romanesco. Need to throw that. Romanesco <laughs> broccoli. You can see it in kind of a yellowish, a purplish, a whitish. It's, it's really neat. I, I just want it as a plant. Yeah, it's like ornamental yeah. kale, you know? <laughs> so it looks like a very dangerous plant. It does look, you know, it looks alien. You're right. It looks like the ground uh, movers that that the the grinders that like built the English tunnel. Absolutely. Or the Absolutely. tunnel. Yep. All right. So let me see here. All righty. So preparing a place. All my gardeners out there, you pretty much know this, but we'll go over the very very basics just real quick here. Um, most vegetable placement is important. You want to have it not too far from your water hose if you're watering with a, a water hose. Uh, don't put it uh, in a place that's going to be really shaded. Most vegetables need six to eight hours of sunlight. You, you know, you don't want to put it away on the field where you have to carry out all your water and all that. Test your soil. I think it's still free right now for most um, Cooperative extensions, you can get it free up till March, through December to March, I think. Otherwise, it's just like 70 bucks and you can get your soil tested and they'll tell you exactly where your, your deficits are, what you, you need to um, augment your soil with for, for all around healthy soil. I highly recommend that. Um, and then, of course, augment it based on, on the findings. And if, if you don't test your soil, you can never go wrong with some fertilizing with some nice organic matter, compost and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, very important. Your soil is very important. Um, fertilize as needed. Different plants are gonna need different types of fertilizers. So uh, that's important to know what type of fertilizer you, the plants you're going um, need. And then pest control as needed. If you're doing it the medieval way, there are some things, some medieval Pest control that we wouldn't want to use today, but you know the tried and true method is pull those suckers off your plants. <laughs> um, there are some natural pesticides to use. Um, you just Google them. Natural pesticide. It's like a combination of chili pepper, Dawn, and vinegar, something. Um, and then you know water as needed. If you're a new gardener, be careful not to overwater. That's the number one cause of death in plants. Too much love. So, and if you're trying to be period medieval in your growing techniques, raised beds, absolutely period. And, um, you know, fencing for security if you've got bunnies or deer or, or just because it looks cool. And um, trellising if you don't have a lot of space, grow things up. I started doing much more of this in my garden in the past few years, and the yield has increased significantly. Even squash that, you know, like just regular summer squash I used to like grow on the ground, I've started 
um, tying up onto a pole and it grows better. It doesn't get mildew, fungus, doesn't get the insects, and it's way easier to harvest. And this is um, parsnip bed right there. And blueberry bushes, which are not pyramids. So some of the things that are easy to grow, uh, the herbs, and you will, you will see um, the herbs grow pretty quick compared to some of the other things like root crops. Um, so herbs, sorrel, good King Henry, if you can get the good King Henry to germinate, it's difficult to germinate, germinate you gotta striate it, raise it, all that good stuff. Um, dock, which is kind of the same thing as sorrel, I have it two times there, but anyway. Sage, rosemary, lovage, chervil, those last two, delicious herbs, really great. You can hear my dog barking there. Radish, um, and the, the black Spanish radish in particular is delicious, it's super hot. You gotta be careful how you use it. I pickled mine and they came out really good and it kind of let it mellow a little bit, that heat. Uh, beets of all different kinds of beets, they are absolutely period and pretty easy to grow. Um, you just need a nice a loose soil so they don't have to bite the soil and pop up instead of growing down. All kinds of salad greens are fantastic. And, and all, of, all of this is, is um, absolutely period and delicious and, and easy to grow. Lettuce, spinach, rocket, kale, collards, mustard greens, Swiss chard, all of that. Turnip and turnip greens, turnips. Timing, <laughs> we need to talk about timing later. Uh, carrots, all kinds of carrots. And, and we can get seed now for some of these, these um, um, medieval varieties. Onions, chives, shallots, garlic, leek, leek. Some of that a little bit more particular. And if you're interested in growing any of these and you want advice, I am more than happy to give you some, some growing advice. Um, if you're gonna do leek, um, seed them soon indoors because they grow slow, um, at least when I plant them. Cabbage, uh, well, the Roman cabbage and the red, the Roman heart-shaped cabbage, and then red cabbage, both of those are um, period. The really dense, hard-packed, round variety we have now, that's common, is, is more of a modern thing, but the, the, the medieval varieties were much looser. Uh, leek, well, we got leek twice too. Parsnips and cucumbers, super simple. I think as and, you're going along, I would love to learn um, partnership planting, like which plants help each other. Cause yeah. I think I've I've kind of messed that up in the past and I have oh. planted <laughs> varieties that kept other varieties from growing. Yeah, sure, the companion, uh, companion planting. And this is been shown scientifically that certain plants, um, keep insects, pests away from other plants. Um, I don't really talk about this in, in this, that in this class, but I highly recommend doing a, a little search on you know, Google companion planting. There's actually a chart that I've seen out there. I actually might have it. Um, I'm gonna write myself a note and make sure that chart is included on the information I send out to you. Plants, okay. All right, parsnips, cucumbers, there we go. So not everything that you grow is going to be ready exactly on time for whatever you're doing. And there are some ways to preserve things you grow. Um, well, that's a whole nother class, but for this particular project, if you've grown herbs and they're ready in July and we're not using them until October, you know, you can dry them. Um, some some herbs like English thyme will, will grow in the cold. I've got a pot on my front deck here that I go out and snip whenever I want. But uh, other things, you know, the root crops. We have, of course, a refrigerator that I, I harvested turnips in, in right before War of the Wings, actually. They're still in my CRISPR drawer and they're perfectly good. And we're gonna use them tomorrow for a class. Um, greens. You're going to need multiple plantings if you plant early. A lot of the greens like the cooler weather. So you plant in, you know, soon <laughs> in our uh, climate down here, um, March, April. And um, 
if you want something like turnips or fresh greens for an event in October, then you're going to need to to plant things in no later than the second week of August. So make sure um, make sure those things get seeded and in. And sometimes you have to shade them too if it's a really really hot dry summer. And of course other things, um, the onions there were onions that I planted for a feast and they were harvested in late June, I remember, and, and you know, they had time to form a skin and dry before we needed them. And there's some sauerkraut, of course, you can ferment things, lacto-fermentation and pickle things, and that's good. And you know, it's a good way to store things is just leave it in the ground and uh, pull it when you need it, depending on, on the type of plant. Um, and this is, oh, this is, this is a slide. I pulled this, this presentation from my medieval vegetable gardening uh, presentation that I've, I've done be in the past. And um, I didn't want to just reinvent the wheel here. Um, so again, my contact information, and, and I do have, um, do I love feedback and whatnot, but I wanted to show you, uh, let's see here, my other, this is a, a presentation I did back in 2015. Oh my God, it was that long ago. It was, I did the presentation for a competition to, to from competition, but it, it was about a project that we did growing at Feast. And I was excited about this and I grew all the food for a feast. I was insane. Why would I ever do that? And how are we doing on time? Oh, we have plenty of time. Um, but working with your head chef is, of course, most important because the chef might say, or your head, your pistocrat, whatever we call them, your head cook might say, well, this is what I want to, to, to cook. And that's all very well, but you have to come back with, well, this is what I have in my garden grow which is far more period than, you know, just picking whatever you want and, and cooking it up. Uh, the, the menus were seasonal. You worked with what you had at the time. And uh, so as this project develops, we'll be working with our, our head cook and um, trying to come up with a menu based on what everybody is able to grow and, and has grown. And the reason why I love this as a group project, because, oh my God, this was crazy, a lot of work and super, super stressful. And I'm thinking, I kind of know what people feel like when they have to de depend on their garden for all their food, because I was like, oh my God, what if it doesn't grow? Ah, you know, <laughs> completely thinking, oh, I could probably just go to the grocery store and get it. But um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. A lot of learning, and, um, and I don't recommend anybody do it by themselves. So, so the menu, okay, this is what we came up with. Yeah, cucumbers, sweet and fermented, root salad, and I believe I think we put beets in the in with the carrots too, citrus, which was I did not grow, but the the ginger you can grow ginger in our climate super easy. Um, the eggs were from my chickens and the, the blackberries from my vines and the honey from my beehives. So I was trying to provide as much as I possibly could from my garden and my yard. So bread was made locally from somebody else. Um, mistress, oh, I see, I need to update that. Honora Hall um, did the cheeses. So it was, it was, a true um, farm to fork a project and, and it was a great lot of fun. Any questions? Okay. And again, I'm researching what could grow. This is this is earlier Actually, on. I have a I question. Sorry, I was not fast on the mute button. Um, do you offer other classes, more long-term classes? Because I see all pot available upon request and everything. 
Yeah, um, I, I do uh, several other classes, you know, specifically growing medieval vegetables and then and then keeping the harvest class, which is about um, period uh, food preservation techniques and um, on, one on, on uh, medieval kitchen gardens, what was grown in the kitchen gardens and whatnot. And, and if, I'm happy to send those um, PowerPoint presentations along after if you're interested. And just shoot me an email if you're if, if you want to chat about this stuff. And if you're not in our guild, we'd love to have you. What guild are you in? It, it's the the newly formed Atlantean Agriculture Agriculture and Animal Husbandry Guild. Cool. I mean, I'm and in Massachusetts, but oh, we we need to start a friends of then because <laughs> and you know it's we use a, a Facebook group pretty much. To, we're brand new, so we don't have a website yet. But um, yeah, we'd love to have the more the merrier. Um, okay. Come, come chat right. with us. I'll, I'll email you. OK, absolutely. So uh, Nor Norlan, yeah. Um, to my cousin from the east, which is where I'm from as well, not Massachusetts, from the Owlshurst at the bottom, um, we have the uh, Oh, Lorelai, what's it called? The Atlantean ANS Agriculture and yeah, um, but so we, we have a yeah, Agricultural ANS in Atlantia is the name of the the Facebook group. And I know we have folks who participate there that are from Out Kingdom, and mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, the more the merrier. We've had people come from the West Kingdom to uh, one of our events when we uh, we do an agricultural specific event. Um, uh, gardens of Time in Oakwood, uh, agriculture and forestry. Um, cross kingdom pollination is a marvelous thing. Absolutely. I'm starting a foresters group. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a newly formed foresters group in Carolingia. So this could be very interesting. Yeah, we have a, a really good and an active uh, forestry group in Atlanta too. Nice. And again, you can find them on Facebook. And there, there are several other um, gardening centric Facebook groups, um, SCA Facebook groups out there too. Um, and I can put those links, let me just write my reminders, Facebook group. And then um, is there, there's a lot of people are doing way more in this subject area than, than you would imagine. Are there any books that you recommend as first time books to look into or are we better off on the web? Uh, that's a good question. I think I think most of my information I got initially was on the web, but I'm going to write that. It's a little bit of an involved <laughs> um, answer. So I'm gonna write that down on my list of things to share with you guys. Because I do have some books, but I don't want time to get away from us. So, so the answer is yes and yes. And there are some books, you know. That. And this, this I'm going to buzz through some of this presentation just because it's an old presentation. But I want to show you some of the things we did. That was a lot of fun. So this is all this stuff I grew that year for the feast, and it was like, um, a little stressful. Stressful mostly because I was worrying that I wouldn't have what I needed for the feast. By the way, we're not really seeing, I don't know, we're only seeing your contact information. We're not seeing a lot of different things. Oh, no. Oh, I have a totally different presentation up. No, we're not seeing it at all. I'm not seeing it at all. All right, let me see if I can get that right. All right. You might have to unshare and reshare if I. Remember PowerPoint correctly? I love that job. Let's see. It says there. Here. Here. How about now? Oh, yeah. That looks OK, so, so this is what I've been talking about for the past. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. So now I'll, I'll just buzz through these, and, and you can see some of the things that yeah. Oh, yeah. This makes so much more sense. Okay. Good. I'm so glad you told me. I thought it was it was sharing. All right. Everybody can see this, right? 
tell yep, me if I you can, can see it. Okay, okay mm -hmm. good. Yep. good. Yep. So, so yeah, we we talked about you know working with the head, the head fee, beastocrat. Oh. What's that? How much property do you have for all your plants and stuff like that? Um, I have a total of two acres, but my my vegetable garden that I regularly use is maybe 20 by 30. So it's not huge. I did need to borrow some of my neighbor's land. He had a plowed field next door when I did, when I grew the fees. But you do not need a lot of room to grow a ton of stuff, especially if you grow up and take advantage of trellising and whatnot. And um, so I'm not using a lot of my land or, I mean, the landscape, I have a lot of fruit trees and, and whatnot, but my regular vegetable garden isn't all that big. Well, and Laurel, I, I think that that's one of the um, advantages if we were to do a group project of growing the feast, somebody who has enough room to have a six foot by four foot um, raised bed or put some containers on their deck would be able to contribute significantly, especially if they were, any feast is going to need a lot of herbs for the seasoning. Absolutely. And, you know, it's if, if we have five people growing rosemary, we're gonna have a gracious plenty of rosemary. Right, we need five people growing turnips or, or you know, beets right. or, or parsnips instead, but, but you're right, absolutely. And geese and I will work on, our, on that project and get information out to people. And, um, and you know, hopefully we'll get a bunch of you that want to uh, participate. Okay, so here we are. This is what I grew for that particular piece. And as much as I love curly parsley, the more period parsley was the flat parsley. No horseradish? Nope. I do have some out there, but we didn't have horseradish in this piece. And I hadn't discovered the, the black Spanish radish yet either, which are really cool. Do they is, taste uh, rhubarb period? You know, I don't know if rhubarb is period or not. That's a good question. Let I can find it, out. Yeah, it, it always I grew, to, grew tried to grow it a couple of times, but the, the crown just rots over the winter. So yes, I've had it twice. Yeah, and I, it, you know, might do better in a pot where it gets better drainage. The the North Carolina soils are so heavy with clay. Mm, good idea. And the dandelion growing the dandelion was pretty cool. It was a, a, I bought specific seeds specific to growing dandelion greens. I don't think they were period, but it was still fun. And again, this was this I did this project in two thousand fifteen. So just some pictures that I did. Um, these are potatoes, not included in the feast. So some of the garden was left for other things. And I uh, think I have some tomatoes back there too. But, but again, um, my neighbor let me use his field for like the lima beans and whatnot, which took up more room. Oh, my helpers, yeah. <laughs> of course, my, my uh, Chickens provided the eggs and the bees, um, the honey, and that's my husband who, who helps me dig and, and weed and plant, and he was picking blackberries and blueberries there. Um, How long did more, it take to life? harvest everything? It, some of it I had to harvest and preserve. Uh, so it was, it was a project. This was a year-long project from my research and the finding the right seeds, selecting, purchasing the right seeds, starting, starting the seeds and then planting them out and you know, weed water repeats and the, the harvesting. It was a, a full year long project. And yeah. I don't remember when the feast was, it was probably like Sacred Stone Baronial birthday in, in September. It was, um, it okay. was up at the uh, Raven Knob uh, Boy right. Scout camp. Right, right, right. Okay, and you had a question Geese or a comment? Uh, just. Uh, somebody asked about rhubarb, and uh, University of Wisconsin Madison has a piece up on the history. It was it was uh, native to Asia, where it was used at least five thousand years ago for medicinal purposes. Oh, interesting! 
There isn't evidence apparently of it uh, being eaten as just food until the English in the 17th century. And they started with the leaves because they treated it like chard. Um, Not the stem, but the leaves. Interesting. Right. And it says by the late 18th century, Europeans had discovered the tart stalks were uh, the better part to eat. Okay. So very not good. food in our period. Very good. Interesting. And, you know, thank goodness we have Asia because they sent us so many great vegetables. So many things. So this is just savory the, oh, grapes. What did, we, what did we make with the grapes? I don't think it was wine. Oh, I think it was a grape compote for the dessert. Yeah, maybe? that's what it was. Okay, I know we had blackberry. Maybe we had grape something in blackberries. Those are all carrots. The carrots were fun. And I think that's a purple cabbage. Yeah, so these were, this was some of the harvesting. Oh, this is not my garlic. That was somebody else's. My garlic didn't look nearly that nice. And it for was the tough. toppers on the carrots, the green part, can you use that for anything or is it too bitter? Nah, I don't think carrot greens are used for anything. Some people cut off the tops and replant them, but I've never found that to work very well. Um, I toss them into my chicken. I'm not even sure the chickens like them very much. <laughs> I think you can also dye with them. I think you get yellow, but I mean, there's no shortage of plants that produce yellow. Okay, okay, well, that's good to know too. And that is a carrot. That's the lunar white carrot. That's not a parsnip. Of course, shallots and, and um, onions, garlic, some of the herbs, the basil and thyme and whatever else we have in there, tarragon and marjoram and blackberries, lots and lots of blackberries. So. So the lima beans were ripe and ready to pick well before the feast. I was surprised at, at how, how fast they grew. Um, so I picked them and canned them and stuck them away until, until the feast. And that, was, that worked out fine. And the, uh, the pickles, we did sweet pickles and um, from the lacto fermented, you know, like dill pickles and, and um, sweet pickles, eight days. And, and these are quick pickles. You know, if you do it through lacto fermented dill pickle, you want to let it sit a lot longer. And they can sit a lot longer, but these were quick er pickles. I think, Lorelei, that depending on the timing of the feast that you're preparing for, you're going to have a lot more time put into preserving. Like if you were, if you were growing for a feast that was for March or Twelfth Night, it would almost all need to be uh, preserved in some way. I mean, some things like cabbage and kale, whatever they're um, they're still coming in, or you could harvest them late. But so many of the things you're any almost any kind of fruit is going to have to be dried or or preserved. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, spring fruit. Um, Absolutely. And, and that is such an integral part to food in our period. They didn't have, they didn't have a supermarket down the street. <laughs> yeah. Where they were importing oranges and, uh, you know, out of seasons. Like you, you said earlier, everything was so seasonal or it was yeah. preserved. And everything basically revolved around the agricultural year. Uh, everything social, everything religious, everything was, was built around the agricultural year. Make sure you take Gisa's class. She'll talk about that later. Um, it's tomorrow. So yes, tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Some of the carrots we grew that just super colorful and fun. And if you grow carrots and they're ripe before the feast, don't worry. Carrots preserve so well in sand, in damp sand, if you want to preserve them throughout the winter. Uh, make sure the carrots are not touching each other. And, um, if you, but, you know, stick them in the fridge, it's probably gonna do okay too for a while. But um, later that, that preserving the harvest class that I teach is all about that. 
So just lots of helpers on Coke Day. And this was the, the delicious red cabbage dish. It was kind of tangy and like a coleslaw type thing. It was yummy. And all my little girls there, all their hard work. And just a few other silly things and lessons learned. I think I talked a little bit about that. Um, what did you do with the eggs? Did you use them as binders and helpers? No, or use them as a main course? We, we, um, I think we made like a deviled egg. I think, actually, I think the way the eggs were cooked, they were super hard to peel. And I don't remember what we ended up doing with them. I think they were intended to be, um, deviled eggs, like medieval deviled it eggs. The, I don't um, remember what we actually did with them. The menu that you had posted said that they were fried eggs, similar, a precursor to deviled eggs. Yeah, it, if I remember, you know, they're cut, take out the yolk, mix it like you do deviled eggs, stick it back in, but then you fry it. So the, the top of it is all like crunchy and crispy. And maybe that's what they did. I just, I can't remember. They um, were a deviled appeal though. I remember that. I think they ended up, they were needed uh, stove space. So they ended up baking them. Um, and they just, it just was, yeah, difficult to feel. So questions were coming up. I think we have until 1050. We're coming up on our, the end of our time. The older the egg, the easier it seems to feel. Yeah, <laughs> Claire, that, that's often true. Although I will tell you what I do. I will, fresh eggs right from under the chicken butt, boil water, drop the eggs in with a spoon gently, set it to 11 minutes, take them out, put them in the ice water, a couple minutes later, comes off like butter. <laughs> and everybody has their trick for peeling their eggs, but, but yeah, it seems if they're older, when they're older, they're, they have less moisture in, and the inside of the egg the skin comes away a little bit from the peel, you know, separates the, the skin from the peel a little bit or the egg from the skin. I'm lazy. I use my Instant Pot. There you go. It's <laughs> easy. Go. So again, as, as this project develops, we would love to have you all participate. And again, even if you just have a container garden on your front porch, you can grow some skirret. You can grow some carrots, you can grow herbs in there, you can grow cucumbers up if you, if you have a, a trellis or something. And we will talk with the, the, um, the, the head chef and see what she, is it gonna be Murin Geese? Is that who said was gonna yes. be? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. So, so Murin, who, who is a um, very experienced SCA um, chef. So, and we'll decide what we can grow and what we can do with those things and create, create a, a, a menu for this demo feast that's going to showcase all of our efforts. And, and again, if, if we can get more information out to you as we go about what varieties would be most appropriate and where to find them. Um, and if you want to try a different herb, that you know about or that you have or that you love growing or love eating, that's perfectly okay too. I'm sure there's a way to work it in. And in addition to the other stuff that I've written down that I'm sending you, I will send the presentations. I'll probably put them together. They, they were two separate presentations. And also a list, I have the list of the cloisters plants. You, are you familiar with the cloisters in, in New York? So, so their cloister gardens, they have a very extensive list of medieval plants. And um, I'll send that along as well as, as, as well as a list of um, where to find some of these, um, some of these seeds. Are you looking to do this like this year for War of the Wings this fall? Absolutely. Cool. So, so yeah, we, it, we have February. <laughs> I'm like making my garden plans like now. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, me too. It's like, like, is this for a real feast that people you're doing down in Atlantia? Yes, it is for oh. War of the Wings in October. And it's not going to be a giant feast for a ton of people. I think it's going to be a smaller demo feast. Correct me if I'm wrong, Geese, or maybe we haven't even determined that yet. 
we get a thousand people at War of the Wings, we can't feed everybody, obviously, but but I think it, it's um, going to be a nice to have people stop by and taste things that, you know, are, you know, we're period. So and if I wanted to participate, I could grow stuff and then drive down with all my stuff. You absolutely could, and we would love to have you. <laughs> and How it's crazy a am I? Event. If you haven't been <laughs> before, it's a very fun event. And, so, and we'll get you in a camp someplace. We'll get the, the Sacred Stone Baronial Camp, if nothing else. And, um, you know, just just yeah. let us know. We're really, uh, we, we spread and, the SAA hospitality broadly. That sounds lovely. If I can make it, I, I definitely want to come. And if you want to go you meet know, rather nerds. help in the kitchen rather than in the garden, that is perfectly okay, too. I do or, both. Or both. Yeah, <laughs> or both, whatever you want. All right. So when is any other season? questions? It's usually like the second or third week of October. Okay. Cool. And I think it's just warthewings.com. I don't I don't know if the the website's updated from last year, but it will It be. isn't yet, but we do okay. have uh, a bid that's been accepted at Kingdom. So awesome. it's gonna happen. Okay. And you can get and, uh, you know, look look around the old website, you can get an idea of okay. that. Um, it's normally around the weekend of, it normally ends about the weekend of the 15th. So it'll probably start the 10th this year. It um, usually starts on Tuesday or Wednesday and runs through Sunday. Uh, yeah. Columbus, it's after Columbus Day. So Columbus Day, Monday, it's the, the week after that. Yeah, Columbus Day is the 9th of October. And if it keeps the same schedule as last year, then it'll start on Tuesday the 10th and run through the 15th. Oh, you went to the blisters, Melissa. That's so awesome. I need to go back. I haven't been in years and years. Field trip. So any other questions? And did I miss any of the questions or comments in the I've been trying to keep up with the, the okay. questions that were asked in the uh, chat, Laurel, I, while you were you. in the class. Thank you. I appreciate that. So if Thank anybody you. did miss, uh, if, I, if I missed anybody, um, ask it again. I've put my email in the uh, chat. I know Lorelai had her email in the uh, presentation. And, and Lorelai, you had mentioned, are we going to do a Facebook group that's just for this? Oh, well, we absolutely could. That's probably a good idea. So we're not clogging up the channels with, with this particular project. Um, yeah, do you want me to form one? I, I think that'd that. be, I think that'd, that'd be cool. I mean, not to get too many splinter groups, but because not everybody on the agricultural, the, the regular agriculture list is, is participating. It might be just easier. Oh, carrots. How did you prepare your soil for carrots? As loose and fluffy as possible and yeah. as deep, deeper than you think. If you say, I'm going to grow a carrot this big, you want <laughs> you know, that much yeah. um, nice, loose, fluffy, terrible soil, not dense, not no rocks. I got some stuff. good carrots in some deep containers, like a big, like oh. the big two foot wide containers. Yep. Yeah, so you don't need as much room as you think to grow a ton of stuff. So, so thank you very much. We are right at time. And I know people have to get out of here and, get and find their other classes. Thank you all so much for, for joining in this class. Um, it may have been- Thank you for teaching. Okay, my pleasure. Yeah, it was probably a little bit different, but we will let you all know um, as we move forward, if you're interested, and you will get an email from me very soon. Thank you.